when the Malaysia jet went down, people were having a hard time figuring out, well, how deep could this black box be or the jet be if they ever found it? The Washington Post did a visualization where you followed the path down, 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 and it would show you different markers of like, well, what would be at this level? Well, what would be at this level? Well, what would be, and you keep going, well, where's the box? Where's the jet? And you go, you're go, you going down, 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 past all these things that you wouldn't imagine it would be that deep. And you're visually doing it. You're going down, you're scrolling down the website page. So it's a great example of following a story, you know, and, and getting building that sense of suspense. And so that made me feel like, okay, that was storytelling. About 10 years ago, I took on the task to teach global development to Swedish undergraduate students. So we did this software which displays it like this. Every I saw Hans Rosling uh, several years ago with one of his first big TED Talks, um, and he just blew my mind, and uh, just the master using data to tell a story. Pretty fast, and in the 80s here, you have Bangladesh still among the African countries. And more, but more than anything, I think he showed the world that this concept of knowledge compression that data visualization offers is just incredible with him. So he'll tell you the story of you know the world over two centuries in a very short amount of time and a very clear and coherent story. My name is Pete Meiser. I'm the principal at Canyon Creek Elementary in the North Shore School District in Bothell, Washington. I'm a geek, uh, and I have an affinity towards data um, because I know it helps uh, collaboration and to improve my practice and to improve our school's practice. I think storytelling is crucial to um, working with data of any kind because um, it has a conclusion, it leads to a next action, a call to action, um, it has a purpose, um, and making it personal along the way um, is, is critical to uh, maintaining the interest of those teachers that are involved in this work, um, and um, certainly trying to get their buy-in and commitment to whatever we might be asking them to do. It's interesting about kind of storytelling and why it has such an impact. And it's really because I think it makes a personal connection. And if you can find the personal connection in a, in a, in a vast amount of information and, and then relate that to a person, they get it. And all of a sudden they remember it uh, a little more effectively. It's kind of almost a pre-attentive thing. And the same thing happens with visualization. If you can build in some kind of pre-attentive things that will signal to the reader, oh, this is important, or you know, look at this increase or decrease, um, then that it hits home a little bit more effectively if you can find the right details. And it's all about finding the right details. So when, you, when somebody tells you a story, you tend to pay attention until you know how it ends. So there is a, a bit of a, an expectation that when you see kind of the beginning of a story arc, you want to see the end of it. And that's, that's an effect that's actually used uh, quite a bit in, in cliffhangers, for example, and also in, in advertising. Where when you watch TV commercials, they start out by kind of setting up a little story at the beginning, but you keep watching because you want to see the end of that 30 second story. When you're thinking about telling a story, especially if you're going any kind of through any kind of chronology or you know kind of traditional story arc, think about it as a scene. Don't think of I want to go get this quote from this person because that's all of a sudden going to become stilted. But how do I create dialogue? How do I create a back and forth? How do I find dialogue and be able to then translate that into my visualization or my story? How do I how do I get that sense of action of of movement? The first thing, of course, you want to do is look at your data. You have to understand what's in the data. You, can, you have to find the pieces you need to, to build your story. And that's, that can be very quick sometimes. It can be a very long process where, where you have to really hunt for the interesting pieces in there. And once you have those, you then start to think about which, one of, which ones of those actually make a reasonable story. One of the things that happens when you're new into storytelling is that you collect all of your information and you get wedded to it. You're, you, you know, you spend a lot of time getting it. You want to prove that you worked hard. And so then you put it all in your finished product. How's it going? Good. You want to go over the uh, redesign? Sure. And it, it, okay. it really junks up your story. It junks up your visualization. <laughs> I'm sensitive to it. That's just me. Um, and there's no way to figure out, well, wait, what's the message? What are you so excited about? So. And it can't be vague. It's got to be detailed. 
It's got to have, you know, a person in it. It's got to, it can't be, oh, I need to, this story is about the state of healthcare in America today. No. This story is about Joe Smith and how he can't get his prescription filled and why. We can't just have one thing here, one thing there, another thing there, and without any connection between them. And that's really what, what the arc is. The arc is the, p the different steps, the pieces that you put together in a way so that they make sense as a sequence and that walk you through this argument, that walk you through the analysis or the story. Emotion is a really important tool and you can get at it in all kinds of ways. If you're just doing narrative storytelling, you might do it through a really poignant quote or a description of a person. In visualization, you can do it through uh, color and also uh, kind of a sense of where you are in a place. So a lot of the data visualization that's out there now has an interactive element, which for me, the interactivity is one of the most powerful parts of it. Uh, and it reminds me of when I was a kid, what kind of books that I like to read. And one of the types of books that I most loved was uh, the Choose Your Own Adventure series. And I love that because everybody read through page 39, and then you had three choices about, you know, where you wanted the story to go. And then of course, based on your choice, you pick the page number and then you got to go and you followed those directions. You chose your own adventure and it was fantastic. I loved that type of book. Um, and you could actually reread the same book in different ways multiple times. I just thought that was the coolest. When I make sense of the data on my own, I bring to it my expertise, um, but I, I also bring my own limitations. I'm just one person. And that interactivity allows other people to choose their own adventure. It's very exciting to me. There's been a lot of, of research in data visualization that's been focused on exploration and analysis of data. But there's a third step here, there's a third part to it after exploration and analysis, and that is the presentation of the data. And that's very important because you want to get people to actually take action. Can you tell a story? Well, you learn in school that you can tell a story. Data visualization does not have to take a lot of uh, coding. It does not have to take a lot of statistical knowledge. It does not have to take a lot of artistic knowledge. The thing about storytelling uh, is it's in a very old form. It was oral where storytellers went from village to village and people could actually write their stories out and there became a structure around that. Photography and storytelling through photos and then cinematography and now we have data visualization. <laughs>